Um, I'm Helen. I know everyone here. I've met everyone in person except for Ramona. Um, uh, I, I head or run or help organize, I guess, the, um, the Homelessness Havra at CRC. Um, it's a newer circle that we just started um, focusing on. So we haven't done a ton of actual hard real life things um, yet but this is part of that jumping off point for me. So I just started collecting supplies to make kits um, and that's kind of where we're jumping off from and hoping to hear from you guys about how we can get more involved with the work y'all are doing. So people have like real concrete things that they can do to make change in St. Louis. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to Sarah uh, who I met at a protest when we got on stage at the Blues, was it the playoffs? The, I think it was the cup, the Stanley Cup. That was it. Finals. Yeah. Yes. And did a little civil disobedience together. Great. Um, so that's how I knew Sarah originally. Um, so I will let you tell us about yourself and the work that you do. You know, it's funny. I think that's how I met Sarah too. At a oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Stirring up some trouble, some good trouble. I love to be in the streets. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can get started. Um, <laughs> thank you for your patience, everyone. Hi, my name is Sarah Watkins. I use she, her pronouns. I am a tenant organizer with Homes for All St. Louis, and I'm also one of the working group members of State Street Tenant Resistance. Um, and State Street Tenant Resistance is a network of neighbors on the South Side coming together to improve our li living conditions. Um, but first I wanna tell you all a little bit about um, Homes for All and our mission and values. Next slide. Okay, the purpose of our group is to improve the livelihoods of socially and economically marginalized communities and that is particularly in working class communities of color. And we believe in and affirm every person's right to housing that is comfortable, safe, and dignified. And so we organize around these core values, which the first one is housing is a human right. Um, the second is most the most impacted must lead. And the third is that housing and land should be collectively controlled and sustained for future generations. Um, it, just in a nutshell, housing justice is racial justice. Um, black people and black and brown people feel the reper repercussions of um, these unequal systems when it comes to housing, the justice system, education, a lot of things are, um, are affected by this. And so um, Homes for All St. Louis is actually a part of a national apparatus of Homes for All National. This movement was born in 2013, and we are made up of tenants, public housing uh, tenants, Section 8 residents, low-income owners, um, even houseless individuals. Um, we are the ones that, these are the folks that are leading the tenant movement, and our sort of theory of change is building a powerful movement of millions of people ready to support each other by taking risks and collective action. So, so right now, Right now, that looks like for us um, canvassing neighborhoods. We support tenants who have issues with their landlords, um, like around getting conditions fixed. We also help tenants who are facing eviction, and we educate tenants about their rights. Um, and then, um, I would say the overall goal is to get people get people to talk to their neighbors and help them find connections to their issues, and then take those issues to the creator. And I just want, kind of wanted to dig in a little, a little bit about the history of housing in St. Louis and how we kind of got to this crisis that we are right now. Um, so as you can see, these are some tools of segregation that have been used in the past, like redlining, um, restrictive deed covenants, racial zoning. Next, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So the Shelley versus Kramer case is a pretty well-known ca case. Um, the 
the uh, tenant was sold a home that had a restrictive deed covenant, which basically said that you couldn't sell to black people. Um, and it, they ended up taking this this case all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and they did eventually win the ability to stay in their home um, in 1948. Like in 1948, I'm sorry, in 1948, it was legal to sell black people where they could live and where they couldn't. And so um, redlining hampers black people not only their housing choices, but also it prevents them from building generational wealth uh, that comes from home equity. And um, so kind of this kind of birth, I guess, out of all of the um, tools of segregation and racism in housing um, in 1969, there was a rent strike um, that actually transformed federal housing policy and it made housing a central issue in the black freedom struggle. Um, so during the 1960s, black people nationwide were facing um, poor living conditions. Residents in St. Louis actually launched the first public housing general rent strike and it lasted nine months. Um, let's see. Yes, it lasted nine months. And as a result, uh, the St. Louis Housing Authority was dramatically changed. Tenants were giving a stronger voice in day-to-day -day operations and um, it also resulted in the Brooke Amendment, which um, yeah, it capped, yeah, it added a rent cap of at least 25% of a family's income. Um, so that's a good thing that came out. That's kind of, kind of a history of tenant organizing in St. Louis I like to talk about. And then the next slide, is just some modern tools of segregation that have kind of evolved over the years, like um, eviction, TIF and tax abatement abuse, um, urban renewal <laughs> and exclusionary zoning. And let's see. so with these tools, like I said, like, like I said, it kind of helped um, fuel this housing crisis that we're in on the next slide. And this housing crisis was exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's disproportionately impacting black and brown neighborhoods. Many households are experiencing income loss. And, and this, this is just really for like renters, but homeowners really never really recovered from the housing crisis in 2008. So this is like a double whammy on them right now with the pandemic and losing income. And on the next slide, so like we said, evictions are being are being used as a tool to segregate um, people. Um, evictions right now are down, but there are still gaps in the system that that's resulting in people being displaced. There's a wave of mass evictions on the way because um, landlords can still file evictions. Remort. Uh, it, also because of the pandemic, um, court is virtual, virtual. So remote court is, remote court um, is inaccessible to some tenants and it makes it hard to have a fair trial. And then also another thing about the courts is, is that in the city, the courts hold the power uh, in, regards, in regards to keeping folks in their home because there are no state protections in place. And then we also see this kind of piecemeal eviction moratoriums where they'll wait to the very last minute to extend it. And that leaves a window of opportunity, I'm sorry, of uncertainty for tenants. And it gives landlords a chance to like rush and try to file a bunch of evictions in that window. Okay, let's see. So like I was saying, um, so we do have some protections in the city. The city eviction moratorium was extended to the end of the month, which aligns with the CDC federal moratorium. Um, St. Louis County is also following those guidelines. And there have been over 8,000 evictions filed um, in the county and the city since only since March 15th. That's a lot. <laughs> and then also on here, 
Uh, also on here, we have a picture of a fake eviction notice. Um, even the, even though some, even though some, some people are protected by the moratorium, um, a landlord will, will go out of their way to get a tenant out, illegally evicting them by giving them fake notices or cutting off utilities or changing the locks. Um, and all that is illegal. It, all that is illegal if there's no judgment in, entered. And then on the right here, we have Matthew Chase, who is like a self, self described number one eviction attorney in the city. He um, organizes other landlords to fight back on the moratorium and, and, and just make it just makes it harder for, um, for tenants to win in court and things like that. And also want to make sure we talk about unhoused evictions. Um, a lot of tent encampments were broken up during COVID, which was against CDC guidelines. And what happens is it, what happens is unhoused folks are displaced even further. It increases instability, folks lose belongings, documents. It also makes it hard for people like Ramona in unhoused STL to stay in contact with these people. Um, and also real quick, wanted to mention Paul McKee, who is a billionaire slumlord. Um, he profits from the intentional destruction of black neighborhoods. Um, it, he actually bought a lot downtown um, and it, it ended up evicting all of the unhoused folks that were down there. Um, it, and we couldn't really do anything because it's private property. So um, here's a few things that I guess we as constituents and the city, city should be fighting for to improve this housing crisis. Um, affordable housing, housing fund, fully funding the affordable housing trust fund, um, ending discrimination based on source of income in, in the county. We need to stop TIF abusement, um, I'm sorry, TIF and tax abatements abuse. Um, and then also tenant, uh, strengthening our tenant rights and um, creating exclusive communities, transi transitioning from private ownership to uh, collective and community ownership of land and housing would also be another other uh, recommendation. And, and so this, I guess, could be a segue <laughs> to what we just talked about recommendations. Um, Homes for All St. Louis is working on a tenant bill of rights. Um, it's designed to protect tenants from being exploited by landlords. It should be crafted, it should be crafted through community engagement, which we're in that phase right now. We are talking to tenants, door knocking, asking folks what they would want to see on a homeless, I mean, I'm sorry, on a, um, Tenant Bill of Rights, and this would bring this would again strengthen our protections because because we know in Missouri that landlord tenant law is catered more toward the landlord. Um, so a Tenant Bill of Rights would would set some standards for landlords that they would have to maintain. And so, why is a Tenant Bill of Rights important? Um, like we just said. It's, it, it's clear that a tenant has to pay rent on time, keep the unit um, clean, but it, it also seems like landlords can pick and just choose what they have to provide to their tenants. So a tenant bill of rights would eliminate that and it would explicitly state the rights that a tenant has. That would also take away the, po take away the power from landlords and restore it back to the tenants. Um, St. Louis, St. Louisans, we have few protections tenant-wise in the city, which results in a lot of tenants enduring slum conditions. Um, it, and we know this mostly affects black and brown um, residents, especially black single mothers. So yes, like I was saying, um, we do have source of income protection in St. Louis. There are protected classes like sex, uh, race, um, uh, sexuality, um, things like that. And we also have to have a notification of rent increases, but that those aren't many, the, those are not very many standards compared to what 
um, I guess a typical city or state would have. Um, so here are some options here that we could that could benefit us here in the city. Okay, and now if we could go over just some common clauses that have been passed in the Tillett Bill of Rights. Um, KC, Missouri has a pretty strong tenant movement right, in, right now. And they're called KC tenants. They actually passed the Tenant Bill of Rights in 2019. Um, but here are just some common things that you would want to see. Me personally, I really like relocation assistance because tenants often are, disp are displaced because of condition, conditions, uh, flooding, mold, any, any, any reason that a, ten a tenant would have to move at no fault of their own should be, should be paid by uh, the landlord, <laughs> I think. Um, another another important one is right to counsel. Um, lawyers and landlords often have representation when they go to court, and te tenants often do not. Um, so, so you end up with a, a bad deal or just something that's not in your your best interest. Um, and another one, right to organize, because, like I said, landlords and their attorneys are organizing against tenants, and even tenants were are being sued for going door, door to door to do eviction outreach. So if we, ha if we had a right to organize in the Tenant Bill of Rights, that would protect, protect us. Okay, so now here we are with, how, how can you be involved in um, tenant rights and Tenant Bill of Rights here in the city? How can you take action? We've got a couple options for everyone. Oh. <laughs> First, I'm sorry, you can go to the next one. <laughs> yes, the first way to take action is to take it to the streets, like you all heard, one of my favorite things to do. These are some photos from some actions that we've done here in the city. Um, on the top left is an, is an action that we did for Sansone Group, who are um, corporate slumlords here in St. Louis. They have properties in other states as well. Um, so we showed up to where they work, <laughs> to where they are. We brought the crisis to its creator. Um, the one, the picture on the top right, it's from a cancel evictions press conference that we have. Um, and then on the bottom here it, are photos from Casey Tenants. Um, they've actually been successful in shutting down their courts in person and virtually. Um, so that's pretty cool. Hopefully we'll get to that point once court opens up here in the city. Okay, and some other ways folks can get involved is sign on to our Tenant Bill of Rights pledge, which basically says that you um, support a Tenant Bill of Rights and you wanna see it passed in the city. Talk to your alder person because the Tenant Bill of Rights has to be passed through the Board of Aldermen. So you wanna, um, you know, you know, talk to your alder and see where they stand on this issue. The other most important thing to do is talk to your neighbors. <laughs> find out, find out what's it, find out what's going on, find common issues, see how you can support each other um, because we are stronger together. Um, and a couple other ways to get involved is, is to volunteer. Homes for All St. Louis has volunteer canvases on um, every other Saturday. We knock doors and talk to people about tenant bill of rights and ask them to sign our pledge. And another way is, of course, to donate because money rules the world, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. And the more money we have, the more, um, the more work can get done, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's just some contact information if anyone wants to take that down. Um, we have me, I'm the tenant organizer, Sharon is the Tenant Bill of Rights Coordinator and Charles is our hotline uh, staffer. And then lastly, just wanna remind everyone that housing is a human right. And if you're having um, issues with your landlord, if you're having unsafe condition or facing eviction, it's important to remember that you are not alone. You're not to blame. 
you deserve clean and safe, dignified housing, especially during a pandemic. And like we said, we, we are stronger together. We have to do this uh, with our neighbors. And that was all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was awesome. Um, I know I'm personally, I, I think that that number of 8,225 evictions having been filed since March is kind of sh shocking. I don't know what the number normally is, but that is an outrageous number, um, considering our population number two in the, in the city. Um, I did have a question, um, those links that you shared for signing the, um, is there a place where we can um, either maybe in the chat or is there a website we can go to where we can click those and for volunteering and donating and signing the petition? Yes, I can um, put the links in the, in the chat. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Give them to you later if you want to email them out or anything like that. Yeah, that would all be great. Thank you. Cool. Um, awesome. I really appreciate all of that. Also that map, that 1937 map was I mean, not surprising, but pretty outrageous. Um, um, I'm gonna open it up to Ramona. Okay. Well, I have a PowerPoint too. It's not as fancy as Sarah's though, so I'll do my best. <clears throat> so I just wanted to start off by introducing myself to you guys. I am Ramona Curtis, the founder of Unhouse STL. Um, we are a community organization. I call myself a grassroots community organization. We are not a nonprofit or not a uh, 501c3. Uh, we don't have official nonprofit status. We use what is referred to as a community centric fundraising model. That means that we pretty much, our fundraising is five, 10, 20, and $50 donations from a couple of hundred people, a few hundred people. We don't have large donations. We don't have large donors. We don't have sponsorships yet. Um, but this is, this kind of funding model is really similar to mutual aid in that it's the community that's helping the community. Uh, and we don't, because of that, we don't have to worry about answering to the man. Um, and we like that. <laughs> Um, so just real quick, I am a journalist by trade and I do kind of PR writing now, but I started just this social media account to create awareness because I kept seeing all this, um, misinformation about the unhoused community and like the social media thing just like really blew up where people were just really interested in getting information about the St. Louis unhoused community. And then people started saying, well, you know, what's your cash app? What's your Venmo? We wanna send you money. What can we do? We wanna do things. So it was kind of like with um, the community kind of activated this whole kind of movement for unhoused STL. So it's been really great. Um, if you could do the next slide, please. So I just wanted to talk about words, you know, because I hear a lot of people say, why don't we use homeless? Well, one reason we, why we don't use homeless is because homeless people don't like it. That really should be enough of a reason, um, but it does dehumanize people. It's got a stigma attached to it. Um, so we, we try not to use homeless. We try to use terms like people experiencing homelessness or unhoused people. Um, I think I saw Sarah use unhomed people or home, home, something, which I liked, but I can't remember it. Okay, but I'll, I'll check back with you. Next slide, please. So um, homelessness is really surprising in the scope of who's impacted. So HUD stands for the Housing and, housing of, housing and Urban Development Department. Um, and they are pretty much the ones that define for the government what homelessness is. Individuals and families who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. So if you go to the next slide for me, Autumn, what that means is that if you live in a motel, 
if you're sleeping on your friend's couch, if you're, if you and your kids are staying in your mother's basement, um, if you're sleeping in a shelter or an emergency place to live, you're sleeping in an uninhabitable, uninhabitable building, you are considered homeless. Homeless is not just those bums that you see on the corner. Homeless families live in motels. Um, unhoused families live with their aunt one week, their best friend the next week, their baby daddy the other week. That is a form of homelessness. Um, next slide, please. These are some statistics I wanted to share with you guys, some numbers and some faces to kind of give you a, an idea of, of how many homeless people are out here, right? So we've got over half a million people living in, in these kind of unstable housing conditions in our country, in this great, beautiful land of the plenty. In Missouri, we've got, what, over 4,000. Um, we've got our veterans, our families with children. Right now, there are over 2,000 families trying to figure out where they're going to sleep tonight. Next slide, please. So Sarah mentioned tent encampments and I'm encampments, and I'm really glad because I wanted to kind of shed some light. I hear a lot of people saying, why should we accommodate that? Um, Mayor Tashara Jones has talked about actually formally supporting tent encampments. Like Sarah mentioned, prior tent encampments were basically just either ignored or disbanded. They were not supported in any way. Um, this new administration says, hey, they're here. Let's make sure these human beings at least have food and water. They're right in front of us. Um, why do people want to live in tent encampments? Shelters are dangerous places, you guys. People get raped. People steal things. They're not nice places to be. Families can't stay together. If um, you have a boyfriend, you guys aren't going to be able to live together in a shelter. He's going to go to the men's shelter. You're going to go to the women's shelter. There are no family shelters that accommodate couples. A, a mother with a child might be able to get in Gateway 180. Um, people with pets will live in tent encampments. I'm getting that a lot. I'm hearing this a lot. I'm actually, um, I can share with you guys, I'm kind of excited. Care STL, which is the city animal shelter, is going to work with us to um, provide support for unhoused people and their pets. So I'll be announcing that soon. I'm really excited because that is a reason why people are living outside, you guys. You can't take your pet. I have a, a puppy. I would be devastated if I had to go somewhere and I couldn't take her with me and I couldn't figure out where she's going, you know? Um, LGB, our LGBTQ population face a lot of hostility. Don't, you know, if they're trans or gay presenting, being in a shelter is a very dangerous place for them. Many of the people that live in our tent encampments are, are members of our LGBTQ community because shelters aren't the place for them. They're also, um, they have a higher um, rate of homelessness because many of them are being rejected by their family. So we've got a lot of homeless or unhoused teenagers that are LGBTQ that have to deal with finding somewhere to live because their parents can't deal with their sexual orientation. Um, substance abusers that can't meet curfew. What I mean by that is that if I use heroin and I know I'm gonna have to use it at 9.30 and the shelter says that I can't go out after nine, guess where I'm not going? because I'm gonna figure out how to get that heroin because I'm an addict and I have a medical problem. So I'm not staying in that shelter. I'm gonna sleep in the street so I can get access to my drugs. Mental health issues. Um, some people just are scattered. They just don't have it together. They can't make it to the shelter in time. They didn't make it to their mother's house in time, but they can make it to that tent. Um, the last thing is, it's just none of our business. We don't, ha nobody has, if a person wants to live in a tent, a human being has a right to live in a tent. It's that simple. It's just none of our business is why people want to live in tents. What is our business is to make sure if those people are living in tents, it's because they don't have homes. 
And what is our business is to make sure that they at least have food, water, clothing, and basic necessities. Next slide, please, ma'am. Why are tent encampments important and shouldn't be disbanded like what Sarah had pointed out? Um, that's where we find our peeps. You know, when we need to give them the medicine, when we're trying to get them to doctor's appointments, we can go to that spot where they usually are. Um, tent encampments actually contained the spread of COVID-19, despite that the city did their best efforts to keep it spread by unhoused, by spreading the unhoused. And like Sarah mentioned, it serves as a home base. You know, these are human beings that have family photos. They have their kids stuffed bears and things that are important to them, belongings that are important to them. When they have those tent home bases, they can keep their belongings there. That's why it's so devastating when the city comes with their dump trucks with no warning and just trashes everything. Next slide, please. So what's the solution? Housing, it's that simple. It's not jobs, y'all. It's not services, it's not programs, it's housing. The solution to homelessness is homes. It's really that simple. Yep, they need jobs. Unhoused people need jobs. They need services, they need programs, but before any of that, they need housing. Next slide, please. So many have adopted the housing first model. Um, the city of St. Louis, what they have is called a continuum of care. That's where we've got a lot of service providers that get together and they decide what the city is gonna do with the federal money. So there's the federal money that comes to the city the city takes it, talks to the continuum of care, and they say, okay, we'll give it to these providers. The continuum of care actually adopted a, the housing first model because people that deal with the unhoused population realize you can give an unhoused person a job, but if they can't get up and take a shower and brush their teeth, they're not gonna get to work. If they don't have, you know, they've got, they need a home before they can work. They need ID, they need a, a belly full of food before they can go to work, y'all. Um, services are great, but they need a house. I mean, the bottom line is they need housing. Um, and what's important, and I think if you could go to my next slide, please. Um, yeah, so here's what's important. And that's my dog barking in the background. Um, services that are attached to government funding have qualifiers, and I'll give you an example. And I hope my, you guys can hear me. I'm so used to ignoring her bark. Okay. <laughs> um, the tiny homes. I don't know if you guys heard about the tiny homes, right? Great idea, right? These little small homes that are affordable, they're designed for veterans. But guess what, what happens? Guess what, how you get in a tiny home? You gotta have a source of income. You can't be a, a substance abuser. You can't be, have a criminal record. You can't have a history of having altercations with people. I probably wouldn't qualify for a tiny home, okay? They make it very difficult to get services, to get housing, there are qualifiers and barriers that unhoused people cannot access. I'll give you an example. I was working with a lady who is dealing with an abusive situation. I helped her get her taxes file and she got her EIC credits for her childcare. She has three kids. This lady got several thousands of dollars, more than enough for first month's rent and security deposit. I'm thinking, okay, we're fine. We're gonna get this lady some home, some housing. Well, she has evictions on her record. She's got bad credit. She's been arrested for marijuana. Despite the fact that this lady had over $5,000 in her bank account, no landlord would take her money, okay? Barriers, it's not even cash. You can have cash and there are still qualifiers and barriers. So, um, I don't, I think that's my last slide, right, Autumn? Because I, I wanted to end it with, oh, no, no, okay, I'm gonna keep going. Oh yeah, I got a whole other part. Okay, so until to get the housing, right? I say until, because the bottom line is what I wanna do is be obsolete. I don't wanna be out here providing emergency services. I don't wanna be out here giving people food and water. 
I want people to be in their homes getting their own food and water. I want to be obsolete. But until we figure out how to get people homes, this is what we try to do. We try to give them food, water, and basic necessities, temporary shelter, some type of social services, mental health support, access to jobs and transportation, and at least a sense of security. Next slide, please. So who, who does that? Me. I'm one of the people that does it. So the reason why I listed these four providers here is that we are all grassroots. What does that mean? We don't have 501c3 designation. We don't have any of that federal money. We don't have any of that city money. Private donations. Every organization that listed is 100% 100 funded by other human beings, not business. Well, some businesses, like Tent Mission, they've got some businesses that they work with to feed people but I don't believe they have formal status and they, we all rely on private donations. So when you guys think about who you're gonna support, there are many organizations out here, but um, keep in mind that places that I, I respect and they're great, St. Patrick's Center is the city's homelessness service provider. St. Patrick's Center has a multi-million dollar budget from the city. Um, so when we've got these big nonprofits, many of them have several hundred thousand dollars flowing through their budgets, um, they have the access and the means with this American Rescue Act, American Rescue Act, ARPA, American Rescue P Act, what's the P? I don't know you guys, but anyway, the federal money for the CARES, right, to get us back on the track. Well, that's actually bringing in a really big infusion of uh, money to provide these kind of services. And that's great. What we found is uh, the organization Places for People has a mobile outreach team. St. Pat's now has a mobile shower unit where they go to several sites during the week and they provide mobile showers. This is all as a result of this ARPA or this CARES Act funding. Um, the organizations that are currently listed, I'd like for you guys to note them and please share these organizations with your friends and family. We don't get that money. We don't have multi hundred thousand dollar budgets. Um, again, private donations. So keep that in mind, please. Um, next slide, please. So what can you do? Don't look away. When you're on Grand and, and 64 or whatever intersection and they approach you, uh, have some water in your car, have a care kit, have a gift card. If you don't wanna give them money, you can give them money. If that $5 is gonna bother you that much, people are hungry. They can take that $5 and go and get a McDonald's sandwich and some fries, or they can get heroin or beer. We don't know what they're gonna do but just release the $5 from your consciousness and think that it's gonna do something good for somebody. Don't hold on to money, give money to people, please. Give them gift cards, give them water, please. Um, during the heat wave, freeze some water overnight, put them in a cooler, have them in your car. When you see people, just hand it to them, you know? Um, something else I'd ask people to do is educate themselves. You guys are obviously one step ahead of that because we're talking right now. Talk to your peeps. Um, don't let people normalize anti-poorness. You know, when you're sitting there with grandma and she says something bad about that old dirty poor person, remind grandma that's a human being. Get engaged and involved. We need a movement, y'all. We need a, mu a movement. That means that we've got to get mad. We've got to say that this is unacceptable. We've got to write our congressmen. We've got to talk to our older people. We've got to talk to each other. We've got to form, organize, mobilize. I'm not an organizer. I have to stay in my lane. I can do what I can do. I can cre create awareness. I can feed people. I can make sure some people eat some days. I cannot also be a community organizer. Some people can, and we're gonna to have to figure out how to all get together and figure that out. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I just wanted to give you guys an example of some things you can keep in your car or you can assemble. Um, these are the kind of things that we do. 
uh, snack packs, things that don't melt in the sun, even though that cream in the Oreos is kind of bad. Um, <laughs> but we really try to get, we really try to make light packages that people will are willing to carry around all day. When you don't have a home and everything that you take is on your person, stuff gets heavy, you know? So we really try to make everything very lightweight. We don't include soap or um, things that require water. We do body wipes. Um, so anyway, this is just an example of some things that we've thought out and um, what we give out. Next slide, please. And that you guys can actually put in your cars because I know you guys see unhoused people. So um, this is just my soapbox that what we need to do is say that homelessness is unacceptable. Um, a, long, a, a few years ago, I forgot what, which president, I think it was Roosevelt, it was really long. We decided that in America, we weren't gonna let our baby starve. So we created food stamps. And whatever you wanna say about this country, if you are a person who has children 18 and under, you're going to get food stamps to feed your children because we decided we were going to do something about that. We need to decide that about homelessness. We need to say it's unacceptable and that we collectively as a society are going to do something. And that's all I got for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, I have just a couple quick questions, if that's okay. Um, the money that this administration is getting from uh, the federal government, that massive amount of money, is any of that, uh, I mean, aside being like set aside for the, some of the organizations, the bigger ones that you mentioned, is there anybody advocating or is it, or maybe you don't know, but, or is the administration talking about just providing housing for, people in the community? Or is it really just directing some of those funds to these bigger organizations that do emergency outreach? Yeah, so what's disappointing is that we don't hear anything about providing housing. What we hear is providing services for people that don't have housing. Services. Services are great. Housing is what they need. The reason why we don't hear the government committing to housing is because they'd have to commit to several million dollars mm -hmm. for poor people. Mm -hmm. I was reading a little bit um, and, you know, aside from it being the moral thing to do to house people, um, it's also the economically smart thing to do from every study I've read, you know, it's about $50,000 a year, you know, for an unhoused person. And, you know, if you just provide them housing, you greatly reduce that cost because they're accessing emergency services less. Mm -hmm. you know, less, less trips to the emergency room, like all of the things. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I know I'm speaking to the choir, but it's kind of insane to me uh, that if people can't be reached on a moral level that they can't at least be reached with an economic argument. I mean, it's just wild. Um, so that's pretty outrageous. Um, well, we're, we're an anti-poor nation, right? What are we taught our whole lives? Go to college, get a good job. Don't be poor. Don't be like them. Don't be poor. Whatever you do, don't be poor. Right. So if we're taught to not be poor, what do we start looking down on? The poor people. Because we don't want to be like them. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to help them. Right. And the other thing that you touched on that I wanted to ask a little bit more about was the tiny home. I had a note about that to ask you about it. And then you touched on it. So. Who's running that? What's the state of it now? Is it just kind of there? And I think they're actually expanding. I heard they're going to have a second village. I'm un unimpressed and unexcited. It's it's 50 homes for high qualified people, and I I'm worried about the thousands of people that don't qualify. Absolutely. It's like it's like a small goldfish in, in an ocean. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think the city is actually administering it. Um, there's a really great guy who I think is based in Kansas City who's a veteran. I forgot his name, and he's got really great intentions, and he got the money together to build these homes. Mm -hmm. And it's great, but what's the problem with a lot of these programs that these, um, I call it the nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> 
the people that they let in their programs are already almost there. Yeah. Right. They've already got some sort of income. They've already got the things that they need. And the reason why is because it helps their success success rate. I can say, oh, 50 percent of the people that I, I let into my program, I got so I got them into homes. Yeah, because you chose the 50 percent that could get homes. Mm -hmm. You know, these service providers, these big ones that are part of this industrial complex, they make people qualify. Mm -hmm. And the people that, that really need the services the most, that really need the help, they don't get in these programs because it's going to make them look bad. They can't get more grants because they don't have a success rate. Yeah. Ooh, I'm going to have to, like, take a drink after this meeting. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> Sometimes I get so worked out up about these issues. You, you guys know when you just talk it out and you really think about that we are treating human beings like this. It's wow. unacceptable. Yeah. I have a, I have a question. Um, so my background, I used to live in Nashville and I was a, I was a homeless outreach worker in Nashville for about five years yeah. um, with Open Table Nashville. And what we saw a lot of there was this like unfettered gentrification and an evaporation of affordable housing, thus creating this huge homelessness vacuum. That was already bad, but it just got worse. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved here about four years ago, it seemed like it seemed like the opposite. It was like, there's not a ton of development here. There seems to be a lot of affordable housing, um, but I know it's not that simple. So what, what's your assessment on what that looks like here? Like, we don't have a ton of gentrification here, but when we do, you know, it's kind of in pockets, right? And like, we have affordable housing, but it's a lot of barriers like you're talking about. I don't know. What do you think? I think, I think Sarah probably will be better, best to answer that. You're so silly. Well, I mean, you do the housing piece. I do the people that don't have houses. <laughs> I would say that um, there's a lack of clean, safe, and affordable housing. Um, and the housing that is available um, for folks who need like, it's really like multifamily homes that we lack, I think. And um, the one again, the ones that, the housing that is, for multi uh, families, they're just in awful shape. They're unsafe and unclean. And landlords prey on certain de demographics um, who have poor credit or low income or um, criminal history or substance abuse problem um, would be my answer to that. And I do agree with that. There are pockets of gentrification. <clears throat> I, hope, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> No, it's, it's just helpful to think about because I know like whenever I'm driving down South Grand and I see a new development, my knee jerk reaction is this is bad. This is displacing someone, which it could be, but also sometimes I'll be like, well, what was there before? And it was, it was literally an empty lot, but it can still be displacing someone at the same time and removing, you know, driving up property values like that can still display, et cetera. Yeah. And also a lot of the development, um, like we were saying that, uh, they profit from um, tips and tax abatements also. So that, that hurts our communities as well. Oh, real quick, for those who may be watching this later and they don't know what a tip is, could you explain that really briefly? Ooh, um, if she can, she's really good because it's very complex. <laughs> can you, Ms. Ramona? <laughs> I can, you know why I can? Because I used to be a journalist and I know how complicated it is. But basically it's a business comes in and they say, hey, St. Louis, I want to build a business here and I want you to not make me pay taxes for a certain period. And then when they start paying taxes, some of it goes to the school district. It's this convoluted way to let businesses get away with not paying taxes. Millions of dollars. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there was a um, development on Morgan Ford um, over in my old neighborhood um, that the other person over there, Megan Green, tried to get a community benefits agreement at least out of the company that was building it. Um, and the president of the Board of Aldermen pieced that apart until it was basically just meaningless and, and got that shut down. So, um, you know, tax incentive financing is what it is. So this company says, we want to build this development, which will be good for your neighborhood, good for your, um, you know, property values, if you're a homeowner, of course. 
or if you're a developer, not if you're a renter. Um, and so we're gonna build this, but we can't afford to build it unless you give us a 20 year tax break or a 10 year tax break. So they rob the schools, they rob the community, uh, you know, taking it out of the streets, everything that our taxes go to. And then meanwhile, somebody who wants to buy a home, um, you know, one can't find one that's affordable in their neighborhood, or they don't get a tax break when they reassess the property values and raise them 100%. If you're a homeowner who maybe even owns your home outright, but you're low income, but you've been there for 30 years, so you own it, and then your taxes go from $2,000 a year to $4,000 a year or $6,000 a year, which make it unaffordable for you to stay in your home. Yeah. So yeah, it's a way to for businesses to um, steal our money, basically exploit um, us mm -hmm. to exploit us yeah and my take on those develop not that autumn you were asking me but my take on those big developments is that there was housing so in the grove where my my businesses are which my um they're repurposed old homes but um you know there are all those uh there's huge developments and if you look at the pricing of those units it's absurd. I mean, they're $1,500 a month for a one bedroom, um, you know, wildly unaffordable for a lot of people. And there were homes there before, um, but they, so I, I know this only because I was trying to find a space to open my shop and you would see all of these buildings that were abandoned, abandoned looking, unoccupied, and you go and you try to find out you know, they're in disrepair, so they can't be inhabited. They're not safe to live in. And you're like, who owns this? And then you find this person and it's some doctor that lives in Florida and they're just sitting on this property and they're not maintaining it. And they're also not taking care of it or making it livable and, uh, you know, renting it out at an affordable price for anyone in the community. They're just sitting on it until some development starts to happen from bigger corporations, a hospital or, um, the tech corporations that are over in the cortex or whatever, and then they sell it, it gets roused to the ground, they build this huge building. So the homes were there, um, you know, maybe it was those homes were in such disrepair that, you know, they, um, that they were uninhabitable and it's uninhabitable and then they can get um, roused to the ground. So maybe it was an empty lot for the past five years, but there were homes there and there's a ton of empty, uh, abandoned properties in the city of St. Louis and, you know, they'll sell them to you at those tax auctions for a really low amount, but, you know, they have they need so much work um, that, you know, even if you could get one, you still might need to put a lot of money into it, which is what I would personally love to see them use some of this federal money for is to get some of these houses that have been sitting empty, you know, up to code for people to just live in. Uh, you know, but I haven't. I'm, Sarah, have you seen the this money that uh, the mayor is spending? This ARPA money, have you seen it go to any housing? Because I haven't heard about it going to any specifically any housing. Mm -mm. No, it's from my understanding, it's all like rental and utility assistance, and that's right. The problem I'm having now, like I have folks who are facing eviction. It's like, okay, we can get secure money, but we actually, where are, are they going to go? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then they're talking about those cash payments, but they, yeah. So. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank you both so much for taking the time out of your evening. This was hugely informative for me. Um, and I know for anybody who watches later, it's going to be great. Um, and I am really happy to support both of your organizations moving forward. This is this is awesome. So I just really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much, you guys. I appreciate it just sharing with you guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Anytime. <laughs> I'll tell you, okay? Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.